Welcome to Predator Minute, the podcast that breaks down the 1987 action sci-fi horror classic Predator one minute at a time. I'm John Zabriskie. And I'm Jeff Glover. With us today, we have a returning guest, Patrick Zabriskie. Hello. Hi, Patrick. How are you? Pretty good, John. How are you? I am good. I am good. Thanks again for uh, joining the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you are you're joining a doozy of a minute. Uh, this is minute Ooh, yes. 22 of Predator. Minute 22 opens with Moonbeam making his way across the camp and ends with Dutch making plans for a surprise party. John, I am excited for this minute. <laughs> I'm excited too. We've made it. We're at the camp. We're at the camp. We're yeah. seeing what's going on in the camp. Checking it out. We're seeing what all the uh, guerrilla uh, soldiers are are doing down there they're very busy very busy john very busy very busy um i want to give a quick shout out to my dad's friend hold on dad previous guest of the show bill zabriskie um told me about a vietnam veteran's perspective of combat in the jungle and the one thing that the vietnam vet told my dad was that you would not have binoculars in the jungle it's it, way too clunky just basically useless Um, And I imagine that comes from too much stuff in the way and you're not going to find like a lot of clearings that you're looking down on like Arnold's doing here. You know what though? Arnold just does his own thing. Yeah. He, he, uh, you know, he rolls to the beat of his own drum and uh, he's like, I'm going to bring binoculars because I need to find out what the hell the gorillas are cooking in their kitchen down there. You want to just start talking about what's going on in the minute then? Yeah. So let's kick things off here. So, uh... Right at the beginning of the minute, we got our our extra down here, our gorilla extra. We were decided to call Moonbeam. This yeah. long flowy mane, and he's uh you know strolling across the the ground, and we get camera shots just kind of going back and forth. We get a shot of Arnold, and it goes back, and we get a shot of the camp, Arnold and the camp, and so we see a couple things in this sequence, and the first of which is Moonbeam walking, and then we get a little shot of this kind of sandbag topped. Like gun turret, do you guys think? A little uh, a little outpost there? Yeah, look outpost. Yeah, there we go. Look out. Yeah. Try to see what it's made out of. It looks like at the top of it has sandbags all across the top. And then I can't tell. Like the bottom almost looks like concrete or yeah. like metal or something. Or brick. Brick, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a, a little bit more. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing like concrete blocks. We'll have a much closer view of it when Blaine and Mac, <laughs> Mac. take it over. Mac! Mac! <laughs> uh, but yeah, we'll, they'll be leaning up against it, so we'll have a little bit clearer view. But yeah, now what what does he see next, Jeff? What what does he pan right to see? So we get uh, he's moves from his left to right, and then we get a nice shot of the gorillas. Enjoying some nice company together. Yeah. Having, having a little meal, <laughs> some camaraderie, having a little downtime. Yeah. How did you put it? You said they're having a... Some food and fellowship. Some food and fellowship. <laughs> some it's food it's and interesting because they've, they've got the gun turret, but they're clearly, they're not expecting an ambush right then and there. So no. Kind of, no, kind of not at all. They're, right someone's saying pass the butter. They're, uh, Yeah. I, what what does he pass? Do you notice that the one guy asks for something, he passes him. It looks like a burlap sack. Yeah, uh, I had a guess of what it was, um, and then I watched a few minutes ahead, and and it's a little bit more clear when um, <laughs> their imminent doom is rolling upon them. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I, th- I think it's just like uh, tortillas in a towel. Oh okay, yeah. a towel of tortillas. Towel tortillas. Tortilla towel. Yeah. Tortilla towel. Yeah. So we get a little uh, we get a little shot of their their food and fellow. Fellowship. And this is a pretty good sequence. It kind of goes back and forth. We get a bunch of different quick little vignettes of the camp, right? Yeah. Yep. And it kind of switches back to Arnold and he's looking through the binoculars. And you pointed out that um, it's this is an interesting choice um, because normally with something like this, we get the classic binocular vision, mm-hmm. right? With like the rounded edges on the screen. And mm-hmm. here we don't. And so I, that must have been a choice by McTiernan. Yeah. Patrick, you want to take this one? Yeah, I noticed that too. Um, I think it was probably um, he just didn't want to uh, limit the visibility um, of what he was showing in each frame that much um, when he was doing that. But I did notice that as well. It also could subtly 
um, indicate sort of Arnold's ability to, he just, he's that persistent. He sees that well. That he just, he just he sees it all. Yeah, he he's just that sees perceptive. I, I doubt that that's probably what it was, but uh, you could read something like that into it. Oh, I like that. I like it. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, he's basically a superhero, so it would not surprise me that he can just see it all. I've seen everything. You know, I've seen it all. Does anybody, yeah. uh, one of the things that, I, that I've that i thought about where he's sort of uh, exposed out on this log while he's watching, even when I was younger and watching this movie, I always felt like he was being a little bit bold here, sticking his head out. Where, yeah. Yeah. Theoretically, You're right. people should be able to see him, but right. he's got- he's, Like the lookouts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so useless. Yeah, he doesn't really hesitate, does he? He just sort of sticks his head up. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, you might be a little more careful. There might be someone on lookout that, you know, has a, a sniper rifle scoped in in that direction. But but he's he's being bold. He's scouting things out. He's uh, he's balancing being covert with being the bold leader and looking and seeing what he needs to see. I've seen everything. You know, I've seen it all. So we can... Mm -hmm. uh, give Arnie that uh there's a, a couple things before we move on if if we're all done talking about the beginning here yeah do yeah. it okay uh, a couple things uh one is this imdb goof that that this goof listed under imdb for this movie uh states that he's looking through the binoculars the wrong way and it's not uh, true right it's not true it's it's it just kind of made me mad at the internet for a little bit. Like, <laughs> ah, how Wait. dare you, internet, make me mad. <laughs> Something on the internet was not correct? <laughs> what the hell is Some, Someone, on? yeah. So when I saw that, I just totally had to watch this. And this was like a few months ago when I was watching mm -hmm. this movie and looking at the goofs. I was like, yeah, that makes, okay, that's a goof. Yeah, okay, that's a, a story, not continuity, whatever issue. Right. But then, yeah, you see that and you're looking, you're like, no, he's actually looking the right way. Right. <laughs> like I've looked at binoculars myself. I know that it would be very obvious and hilarious if he was looking the wrong way. It's just the little part sticking out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like, oh, they're really far away. <laughs> <laughs> About 200 clicks. Hey, aren't we awfully far away? That would be, that could be, if he was looking through it backwards, that would be a reason why he'd be sticking his head out so far. Oh, they're so far away. <laughs> he's like super close to the camp. He's like, oh, this Still fully far away. I can hear yeah, them. How do I make these work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's pretty silly. Because even you see it later in the minute when the camera kind of swings behind him and we get the sad music, which we'll talk about in a second. He's clearly holding it the right way. Yeah, like you clearly. can see the little the little eye uh, lenses. Like you can see that on the other side. Yeah. Yep. So screw you, internet moron on imdb yeah. you're wrong you're wrong your <laughs> mom's wrong too for some reason <laughs> uh, the other thing i wanted to mention about the camp before we move um to the up close scenes is that as arnold's looking through the binoculars you see a ton of dead foliage which is your indicator mm -hmm. that they're still in puerto vallarta because the puerto vallarta jungle scenes where they shot um, was mostly a, a deciduous forest um, at least one that experienced the seasons more dramatically and therefore, when they're there, I think they're there like late spring or something like that, or some season where the foliage is all still dead. When you're, he's looking around, you can see that very clearly. Um, and yeah. it's, it's going to be, I think, as because we're watching this minute by minute, it's going to be a real drastic turn for us as viewers to see mm -hmm. when, oh, now they're in Palenque on the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, everything will be more lush and more green. But here there's just like dead vines, dead leaves, dead trees, just lots of brown. And remember when he's crawling down the hill in that long shot, Jeff, last minute, is that yeah. he's totally just moving through this sea of dead leaves. Yeah, and we get a little more of that later on in this minute. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, when all his buddies just <laughs> yeah basically sprint down on their bellies. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll talk about yeah. that because that's pretty <clears throat> funny. Um, yeah, do you think McTiernan was like, okay, let's set up the shot. And someone was like, uh, Mr. McTiernan, all the foliage is dead. And he's like, fuck it, we'll do it live. <laughs> we'll do it live. <laughs> we'll do it live. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Just get the shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's what happened. <laughs> Yeah, obviously. Yeah, and the, I think I think at that point when he was filming, he was just thinking, "Man, I can't wait to have a little bit more control." Than maybe when they had to pause for reshoots for the creature redesign and the costume redesign of the creature. Mm. I think maybe that's where he was able to leverage his 
power that he was gaining with the studios, sending in the dailies and then being impressed with what he had so far um, to give yeah. him yeah. the privilege to move locations. Here's a, uh, speaking of the creature. Um, mm-hmm. So as I was rewatching the movie kind of up to this point, mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, and some of the preceding minutes up to this point, we saw some of the first, uh, infrared shots. Yes. Uh, in indicating mm-hmm. that the, uh, uh, team is being watched. So during this scene, um, the preceding ones, there's something to be, uh, keeping in the back of our minds here is that, uh, the predator is presumably watching, um, these guys do this, uh, do this mission and is noting how they operate noting how they move. So... Not only is Arnold watching, yes. but the Predator is watching that. Yes, we, we have another a, a good killer POV. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. the Predator is watching, Arnold watching. And um, in this yep. script, a quick script aside is that um, the Predator is watching them the whole time as they conduct their guerrilla camp raid. Um, but I really appreciate mm-hmm. the choice to make the... Um, Predator wait until after the battle has taken place. The battle, sorry, has after the route has taken place, the <laughs> the behind the woodshed beating has taken place to actually see the predator vision again. Cause during this scene, it's it's nice to give just this moment to the team and showing what they can do. Yeah, that's true. I they just kind of you get a it's it's a cool choice, I think, by McTiernan and the scriptwriter is like you get a little taste of the predator. Mm-hmm leading up to this point and then it they just put it on a shelf for a minute and we get this action sequence that's going to happen and uh you're right they just leave it on its own and let it let it stand for itself and uh i think that's good because then as in the audience you almost you don't forget but you kind of it goes to the back of your Mm -hmm. mind um and you just get to enjoy this action sequence and then later on you're like oh yeah that's right there's an alien or something (laughs) out there and uh, yeah, kind of, I, I, I like that. I like that choice. Uh, uh, it, it's a good way to sort of draw you in and then let you sit for a little bit and then surprise you again with mm-hmm. it later. All right. So this takes us to a little <laughs> murder. Murder. A little, a little bit little of violence. Murder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, murder. Are we ready to talk about uh, our gunshot? Yeah, to the let's head? talk about it. Yeah. Our juicy squib. Okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So juicy. So <clears throat> we get, um, I like this sequence, by the way. Like Dutch is kind of looking, and I love how they throw in the sound effect of like a loud grunt or a yell. And then Arnold's eyes move yeah. off to his right. And yeah. And so, and so clearly something's going on. Um, and then the camera switches, and we get a shot of a, a gorilla soldier with, uh, presumably an American hostage. And then we find out that it is in fact, well, at least it's a hostage that speaks English because he says something in, in, does it sound yeah, like I, Russian I, to you? Yeah. I, I imagine the big guy here yeah. says something in Russian. Yeah. And then we hear the, the yeah. guy go, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, we get a cut back to Dutch looking at the binoculars and then we cut back to the, uh, kind of a more close up of the uh, Soviet officer holding the prisoner by the hair and then wah, wah, pulls out his pistol and shoots the poor bastard in the head. Yep. For an execution scene, this, this thing is like just, I mean, he's being executed, but on top of it, it's like, there's just so much just physical trauma. This guy is going through before that. And just, he, oh, yeah, he gives him a nice kick to the chest. Yeah. A nice he? kick to the chest. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's, 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 he's playing the part. Blood. Yeah. Yeah, it's cold, man. It's cold blooded. He doesn't even hesitate. Yeah. So it makes me wonder what did this guy do? Yeah. I mean, that's there's a lot of speculation for yeah, for what what he did, for what happened bef- right before this scene cuz Arnold's just kind of dropping right into this scene as this voyeur just what, what's going on? What yeah, you do? wonder, you know, was he interrogated and didn't give anything up, so they just disposed of him. Mm-hmm. Did he try to escape, and that's and they grabbed him and then just executed him? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. Do we have any fan theories? Uh, as, if I count myself as a fan, I would just say mm-hmm. that this is a CIA guy who uh, they took from the chopper and the big this big gorilla guy. Um, we'll just go ahead and call him a Russian or Soviet because <laughs> yeah. he looks completely different than everybody else. And we'll talk about him in just a second. But uh, yeah, I, I think the this officer looking guy 
is trying to get some information out of this this hostage out of this prisoner um knowing that he's american knowing that he's cia which right are are big leaps that we have to take because they don't say it here on the screen yeah i agree um i was trying to figure that out it's just sort of watching up through what we gotten if we could safely assume he was from the chopper or not but yeah i agree he probably is um probably got interrogated probably wouldn't give up any info i was wondering if maybe part of the reason and this is Take this with an enormous grain of salt, because this would be wild, Mm -hmm. uncharted fan theory territory. Right. I love it already. (laughs) But maybe he, maybe he saw the predator, and maybe he went running wildly in fear, and maybe they found him. And maybe the real reason why he's executing him is that he's uh, thinks he's just totally insane, and he's an American. (laughs) That gives him even less reason to want him alive. Sure. Uh, but that <laughs> that's be, great. I like that. That's oh, pretty yeah. good. Yeah, that's that's wildly speculative, so take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> that's great. I I think that's uh very plausible. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> now John, you mentioned uh in your notes here uh, a, a few things about the actual gunshot to the head. So we get a nice ju- a juicy squib. Mm, juicy squib. It. Yeah, it is very nice, splattery. Yeah. Nice bit of movie magic there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great movie magic. Yeah. So do you want to talk about some of the uh, practical effects behind that shot? Sure. Yeah. Um, just first off, the prop gun that Sven Oli Torsen is using. And we'll, we'll go ahead. We'll <laughs> name the actual actor. Uh, but oh, yeah. His so, name. Yeah. 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 Spinelli Torsen. We'll, we'll, we'll talk all about him. He's, he's basically going to own this minute, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but he is holding a he's holding a Walter PP, which is Walter PPK. This down the line, I guess, of the same model of weapon that James Bond used, the Walter PPK that I've uh, cited yeah. in a couple episodes, and my dad pointed your, out in the your weapon. Dad's episode. favorite, yeah, my dad's yeah. favorite. Yeah. Way to go, Dad! Oh. Killing Americans <laughs> with that gun. <laughs> but, um, he's holding a he's holding a Walter PPK or PP, and then the people on the IMD firearms page said that this is likely held in place, or it's likely a placeholder gun. Um, that more likely Sven would be holding a Makarov PM pistol. So this is supposed to most most closely resemble that that yeah. Russian firearm, right? Okay. Be thinking about Russian or Soviet um, firearms, like we been talking about juicy squib right here um when uh sven shoots the hostage in the head clearly they have this huge blood packet where the actor's head is turned an- enough away from the camera where you can't see it because that thing just bursts and it just burst beautifully after the gunshot you know against yeah, the sandbags pretty perfect yeah. yeah yeah against the wall it does this like oh my gosh like all, for all the things you that think go that together they, uh do you think that they intentionally put those sandbags there to kind of make the blood <laughs> stand out a little bit more? I think they put the sandbags yeah. there just to cushion his fall. Because <laughs> oh. his hands are tied <laughs> behind his back and he's like falling straight, straight over. <laughs> um, That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Because it does provide a nice backdrop. Oh. You're right, Patrick. Yeah, yeah, you get a good splatter right there. And you get you, you you even see the splatter sort of hit his hair and it sort of flies up. Yeah. Uh, pretty great. It's pretty great if you enjoy violence in movies. <laughs> yeah. And like it, as his head hits the sandbag, it leaves like another just bloody trail. And oh, it's yeah. Just falling. And, and you even see some of the color of the blood against uh, the white sandbags. And there's some white on the wall there. But it, it's interesting. So because you would think, oh, he's, he must be using a blank to make that sound, to make that fire. Not at all. I, I guarantee the sound one is added in post um sure it's it's such a such a loud pop that um i'll have to put in what an actual walter pp sounds like when fired but it's not going to sound like that um it's going to sound like a lot lighter and tinnier but second like i know what i'm talking about but second for the (laughs) for the flame um um, he's he's using what's called a flash paper gun uh, it's re- <laughs> it's going to be another Arrested Development. No, I'm afraid I just blew myself. <laughs> Reference, because um, <laughs> the flash paper gun is what Job uses when he's performing his tricks with fireballs and such. And there's one funny scene where he's at the boardroom or... And I think he's maybe talking to Sally Sitwell or something like that. And then he tries the fireball and just lighter fluid comes out and does it a couple of times in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> One of his lines becomes, but where did the lighter fluid come from? Did you just 
squirt me with something? This lighter fluid didn't put it into Flint. But still, where did the lighter fluid come from? <laughs> He's playing people. And so it's like this wrist thing kind of attached. Um, you would attach it um, to the wrist with the gun in Sven's case here. It must be what, I think it's his left hand, so you can't see it. But um, it spurts this lighter fluid and he has this little... The lighter fluid! ...thing to cat to make a little flame. Just like a, just, just like a little tiny bit of a flame. Um, yeah. But again... It's enough for kind of one burst. Yeah, but it is called a flash paper gun. So maybe the one I was looking online um, when I was looking that up, maybe maybe people named it incorrectly because I think would you really be spraying a bunch of lighter fluid and the lighter fluid, you know, a flame next to this guy's head. When I think flash paper, I guess I think of like an actual like piece of paper that you you know spontaneously combust really quickly. So I could be totally wrong there. Um, we know he's not using blanks because you would not be holding a a weapon with blanks in it against someone's skin because um, right. blanks, they're still bullets. They still hold a little bit of gunpowder um, and they still eject from the gun. Um, and yeah. In fact, there have been fatal accidents where people have died during filming or like in between scenes, um, just kind of playing around with guns loaded with blanks. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah you, I, I think you might be right there. They, cause you don't get, when he fires the gun, I'm looking at it, at, at it right now. Mm-hmm. You don't get like a, you, you don't really get a flash. You know, sometimes you'll watch an action movie and especially when the weapons are, are aimed towards the camera, you'll get that, that flash, that yellow flash that they oftentimes will paint in or add in post. Right. Um, but in this, you just get the blood splatter and the sound effect and that's yeah. it. Which makes me think that it, it's the actual filming. It was probably just the squib and then maybe a little mechanism to let off some smoke and yep. uh and they added the sound effect afterwards yeah right. if you break the shot down and kind of go through it piece by piece it's interesting because blood the squib seems to break before anything else and then you see the smoke and then you <laughs> yeah. see this tiny flame. right yeah. i noticed that too <laughs> it's like he's snapping something after he shoots or hype it shoots in the movie it looks like he's as he's snapping it away from the guy's head. So I'm thinking maybe that's like kind of the movie yeah. magic. It's like, well, I can't snap this against his head, but if I do it quickly enough, it'll look like I'm shooting the actual gun. Yep. Yeah. Oh man. I've just watched that like 10 times in a row. That poor bastard. Yeah. <laughs> he died every time. <laughs> <laughs> every single time. So we should talk about the man that is holding this gun. Yes. And doing the firing. I did not know this until uh, you brought this up in this minute, John. But that is a, a somewhat famous stuntman, mm-hmm. a slash actor, slash director. <laughs> who, dude, the list of the movies he's directed, we'll get to that. But that's incredible. Um Wait, he directed movies? I, I I thought you put that in your oh, list. Oh, I think you're mixing up to... I think you're mixing up his acting credits with the hostages directing credits. Oh that's okay. all right. We'll cut cut that out. Sorry. Cut what out? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but anyway, so yeah, we should talk about Sven Oli Torsen. Let's do it. Is that how you say his name? Sven Oli Torsen. I believe yeah. so. He is Danish, and I think the Danish pronunciation of that last name is Torsen, kind of like Tor, not yeah. Thor. Well, man, yeah. this guy has had quite the career. I knew nothing about him until we researched this for this minute. Mm-hmm. And he is a, he's Danish. No, excuse me. Yeah, Danish. Yep, Danish. Um, and he is bodybuilder, stuntman, my favorite Strong thing. Strongman competitor. Yes, yeah. he was Denmark's strongest man in 1983. Six foot, five feet tall. Um yeah, so He's taller than Arnold, right? Yeah. yeah, I think I think Arnold comes up to five ten, five eleven. Uh, from what I've read, it, the accounts say that he's a lot shorter, or he's shorter than he's listed on IMDb, right? Mm. Like the official things um, over you know, over over size him. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, John, do you want to go through some of his filmography here? Sure. So when I was doing the notes for this minute, I was taken aback. Or I was taken aback. I was taken back to the simpler times of Predator Minute when uh, <laughs> all that we did was kind of trade back and forth what someone's credits were because the opening of the movie has about four, four and a half minutes. No, three and a half minutes of credits where each time a credit pops on the screen, I'm just madly researching to find out what this person is all about, what they 
what do they do? What are they known for? And Sven Ole Torsen is not listed in the opening credits. So mm. luckily for him, he has a standalone minute. And uh, that's pretty rare. I think he's the only one who's going to be like that this movie because everybody else uh, featured in the movie so far and including Kevin Peter Hall and El Padilla Carrillo were featured in the opening credits. So he has his own little standalone credit minute. So good job, Sven. I'm waiting out. Yeah. Uh, but Sven, Oli Torsen, has 75 IMDb acting credits to his name. And that's really up there with um, the incredible. highest. Yeah, the highest number of credits for people in this movie. Um, and fifth, and, and correct, uh, you put on here that 15 of them are movies where he was also in the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes, he, he acted in. Wow. 15 Arnold movies. I'm just going to head, go ahead and list them real, real, yeah. real quick. Uh, Conan the Barbarian, Conan the Destroyer, Red Sonja, Raw Deal, Predator, and I will say one, two, three, four, four out of those first five movies, Arnold kills him. Oh! Ah! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. The Running Man with Jesse Ventura, mm. Red Heat, Twins, Total Recall, Terminator 2, Last Action Hero, directed by John McTiernan, Eraser, Jingle All the Way. Almost as many people as there were on the opening night of my smash holiday movie classic, Jingle All the Way. All right, now that, that's just ridiculous. That movie's eight years old. <laughs> Batman and Robin, he's the one who says, <laughs> what killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age. Well, not him, but Arnold said that. <laughs> <laughs> I just Please. love that one. Please. Ice to meet you. Um, kick some ice. Let's kick some ice. <laughs> kick some ice. Uh, oh, my God. That fucking yeah. <laughs> So good. End of days, <laughs> collateral damage, and the rundown. So those 15 are just with Arnold, which became his calling card because um, initially Arnold was his bodybuilding buddy who brought him onto the scene and kind of into Hollywood. And he really stuck around stick around uh, mm. for quite a while. And um, I don't remember when his last role was, but um, he's, I believe still acting or just a couple of years out of uh, acting, but he's definitely got a unique presence. I'm talking about some of the films he's been in. Um, so have you guys, <laughs> he, what my, one of my favorite roles, and this is before I actually knew who he was is in Conan, the barbarian, which mm -hmm. uh, I, that movie, I think, has gotten a mixed response from most people, but I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Conan, what is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of your women. That is good. That is good. Um, I think it has a, a pretty it, strong cult following out there. You're not alone. Yeah. Okay. He plays uh, one of... Uh, so the main villain in that movie is called Thulsa Doom. Awesome name, but he is... Yeah. Uh, one of Thulsa Doom's main henchmen. Right. James Earl Jones. Uh, yeah, James Earl Jones plays Thulsa Doom. Yeah. And, uh, Sven wow. plays one of his henchmen. And he, uh, I don't think he actually says anything, but he's got a pretty commanding presence. And I'm sure that's the case in all of his films. But he's got a very commanding presence in Conan the Barbarian. And mm -hmm. he just looks so cool in the scenes that he's in. So I've always... Now, is, is Conan uh, the Barbarian, is that the one where he goes out due to like a home alone style trap yes and he does yeah conan the destroyer they're... i think he dies in a sword fight to arnold but yeah go ahead yeah. do you remember the, the... You're at, yeah you're uh so yes so at, at the end of near the end of conan the barbarian they're in a uh, a stonehenge kind of burial area and you're absolutely right that uh, a bunch of thulsa doom's men are going to take down uh conan and conan's sidekick sabatai Hmm. I know this movie. <laughs> you know this movie. Conan <laughs> and, uh, Minute. It's Conan Minute. <laughs> Love it. They, uh, they do set up Home Alone uh, traps. And I believe the actual trap that kills uh, Sven is uh, Hon Conan puts a helmet or something down and it's obscured such that uh, Sven's character thinks that it's actually his head that's there and he attempts to hit it and mm -hmm. in hit it trying to hit the helmet it uh, trips off a bunch of levers that cause a giant spike to swing around and stab him right in the uh, right in the stomach Oh, and just the noise wow. he makes. I uh, I was watching the death reel, basically, of Sven Ole Torsen. That's how I knew that. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is <laughs> it is a great death noise. 
if you ever played the um the arcade game golden axe that's exactly what the death sound remind me of because when you kill one of the big bads in golden axe he just makes this kind of sound <laughs> it's totally going to drop in here during the episode but he totally makes that when the big home alone spike just go rams him right through it's so good <laughs> <laughs> a very it's a very memorable death very memorable and most actors would kill for having a memorable death scene yeah and he has he has a few of them he has one in this movie uh he right has a good one in raw deal where he's killed behind a bar you know trying to shoot at arnold and arnold shoots him and and spin turns around and his death wobble grabs like the top shelf of this bar and just pulls all these glasses and bottles down <laughs> on him. it's mm-hmm. so good And yeah, he, he said it was so hard to, to train for that death scene because he's never done one of those. He's He imagined like he would just fall straight down and instead he just spin her. He's being told, no, you have to spin around and grab this top shelf and just bring it down on you. And he totally does it. He totally sells it. So <laughs> I love that you compiled a list of his the names, like his credits that were in movies. Yeah, because right, because most of his parts are small. He's usually dying, or he plays a small role as a as a big bad, or or kind of a henchman or something. Yeah, and you you listed some of these part names, and I, they are fantastic. So he has been credited <laughs> as Tank, Thug, Russian henchman, the bearded bodyguard, Russian officer. Uh, Sven, his own name. His own name a couple of times, yeah. which is one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Call him Sven. Uh, just mechanic, henchman, doorman, prisoner. This is my favorite. Cyborg interrogating yeah. old woman. I knew that would be beautiful. <laughs> From the movie Cyborg 2 with none other than Jack Palance. Tango and Cash. Dude, that's amazing. I didn't even know a Cyborg 2 existed, and I Tango. love the original Cyborg. Cash. And the fact that Jack Pal, how did how the fuck is Jack Balance Tango and Cash in Cyborg uh, Two? Uh, what? <laughs> That's insane. It's insane. That is insane. He must have needed a paycheck. Yeah. Okay. Keep uh, keep name keep naming them. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, the Demon Gunman Mob Boss's Bodyguard uh, Terrorist Number One. <laughs> Huge man. <laughs> Huge man. <laughs> uh, gunman at motel. Boris. Paris. Would-be king. Ooh, the Tigress of Gaul. Yeah, uh, just quick aside. That's probably his longest featured scene. That's the one where he's fighting um, Russell Crowe in Gladiator. He's the retired oh, gladiator. Yes. And they have the tigers on chains. He said, We who are about to die salute you. Uh, in an interview, he trained for like months um, to perfect that part. And he was up against none other than the Incredible Hulk, Lou Ferrigno, for that scene. Oh, Lou um, Ferrigno. Yeah. So he uh, plays that's that. That's a great scene. He's actually really yeah, good in that scene. Really good in that it. scene. It's really memorable, yeah. partly also because of his look. He has this slide down mask that looks very, you know, statuesque and blank yeah, yeah, as he's yeah. fighting mm-hmm. Russell Crowe. Go yeah. on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um <laughs> Oregon State Prison Guard on Watchtower. <laughs> Russian hitman, landlord, bomb victim, machine gun mongol. Uh, that should be the title of a movie. Yeah. Uh, just goon, lumberjack hit by ball. In dodgeball. Uh, oh, that's right. He was in dodgeball. Good movie. Uh, laughing raider, hooded that thug guarding hostages. That should be a movie. Um, <laughs> laughing raider. The list goes on and on. It's really pretty great. I am very jealous of his uh, career. I wish I could list this as things I've done in movies. It's pretty great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, and I take back what I said about him being mostly featured there, the most featured in Gladiator, because he was the main villain in the, Vest- the Jesse Ventura vehicle of Raxus. Now they're sending me out to bring in Secundus, my ex-partner. <laughs> Where he played the big bad name Secundus. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I win. See you soon at Braxis. Wow, I've never heard of that movie. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 laughably sci-fi and yeah, over the top ridiculous. 
but yeah, so he's he's been all over, and he has a he has a character type. Um, he's speaking Russian in this movie. Just briefly, you hear him kind of muttering Russian. I think as he walks away from the executed hostage, but in real life, he did not speak Russian. He speaks four languages: Danish, English, German, and Swedish. Mm. Yeah, sounds. He said something like "Nachivas" or what is it? Nachivas. Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah. yeah. I wonder if, uh, if somebody has ever translated what he said. Yeah, I looked yeah. and I couldn't find anything. And in this script, it doesn't mention any kind of talking between the two. Uh, it just mentions him taking the shot, <laughs> taking the shot, and mm-hmm. walking away, just back to his own hut, his own palapa. So Sven Oli Thorson. Yeah, um, he w- and one of the things I've talked a lot about that that this movie is really known for is they had a weight room or weight setup for everybody to get their pump on to push some iron around instead of pushing pencils. What's the matter? The CIA got you pushing too many pencils. I love that they just brought it to set. Yeah. And the, Dude, the work on the buys and the tries. <laughs> the buys and the tries is just increase the macho ness of the movie. Oh yeah, it's just <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. People enter and just pure muscle and testosterone leave. Can't you just picture it in between takes? They're like, let's make protein shakes and work on our glutes. <laughs> I, I want to say that that's actually uh, that working out for these kinds of movies actually does take up a lot of your time because I want to say that I remember watching an interview with uh, Stallone about Rambo First Blood Part 2. Oh, yeah. And he was talking about getting up at 3 in the morning to work out and swim and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, to, so to keep that physique, I mean, those muscles don't make themselves. No, gotta, they don't. They don't. I can attest. I work <laughs> tirelessly. <laughs> I work really hard on not having those kinds of muscles. <laughs> um, well, I mean, what's nice, what the big difference I would say between this and Rambo is that you have this team working out and they would push each other constantly. And I mean, they're such like alpha males. They're, they're just all, they're always competing. There's some fun stories to dive into. I don't have them in front of me right now, but come back another minute, I guess, and then share some of those. But um, the weight room, um, the point I was going to make was that Sven was the one who would organize and build these mobile gyms at the, at the movie sets. And his quote says, uh, one time when we were filming predator, I set up the gym as usual. Imagine all this is being said with a Danish accent or in Danish (laughs) and the other cast members wanted to use the gym. I wasn't hired as an instructor or anything, but when someone wanted to use the gym, I helped them settle in. So I came up with the idea that they had to pay for membership, a bottle, a bottle, a bottle of Dom Perignon. Whenever the occasion required champagne, I went to my room and got 10 to 20 bottles of Dom Perignon. (laughs) Arnold was wondering where the bottles come from. So when I told him about it, he just smiled. (laughs) Was the champagne. It was his gym, but he enjoyed the champagne with the rest of us. Uh, so I just, I just love the camaraderie extends to, hey, here's like right someone who's right one of the <laughs> premier bodybuilders of the yeah. 80s. And, and he, what's he doing? He's sent up the gym. He's right. He's, he's running a little racket, just yeah. saving up champagne bottles. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. He's like, hey, we're going to have champagne. Like, hey, guess where it came from? You all. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's celebrate with your champagne. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sven. I feel like I know him intimately now. Yeah. Oh, and um, if you do speak Danish, um, he published an autobiography back in 2007, Sterkmand i Hollywood, which is Danish for strong man or Viking in Hollywood. Uh, so mm. if you speak Danish and you know some about that, right? Let us know. Email us. Email us. Let <laughs> us know because I look for an English version. There's not an English version. It would, it would be fun to read through some of that and all the stories he must have of being in the background of these movies and working with these figures such as Arnold and Jean Claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal. Wow, there Jack was no English, uh, English translation of his novel or of his uh, book. Nope. Not not that oh, I could wow. not that I could find. I found some uh, forum where guys where for, people were talking and they're saying, Yeah, yeah, it's supposed to come out in 08, but uh, I didn't find one mm-hmm. from 08. Gotta throw it into a online translator and try to get the gist of it. It's it's interesting because in in a way, I mean, he's he's managed to do something that's very unique in Hollywood where he's able to he's been able to have a multi decade career mm-hmm. and be in big films, but at the same time, uh, most people uh, don't know who he is, so he's been able to 
to work in movies and work in this industry, but he's also been able to retain a sense of privacy. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it's that's pretty amazing. And uh, you're right. I, I didn't know this guy existed until yep. we did and, the research for the show. And he's and, had a very prolific career. Right. But if you saw him on the street, most people wouldn't know that. So it's it's yeah. an it's a very rare niche to be in, in uh, or niche, sorry, uh, niche to be in in Hollywood, where you can have a career that long and, and to keep working and to be in some of these big films. And yet um, you still have that sense of privacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of perfect. Unfortunately, we will not have that with the success of the Predator Minute podcast. So, <laughs> right. Sorry to you all now, but just just yeah, be prepared. Kiss your anonymity goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's um, so it's it's interesting you bring that up, Patrick, because I'm going to backtrack in my notes here real quickly and say, hey, like we're seeing these what looks like maybe Central American campers here at the gorilla camp and then Svenoli Thorson he stands out in many different ways like he's just so huge and also he doesn't look really like the campers at all um, and that's because his character is meant to be a Russian advisor or a Soviet advisor for these gorillas so if you think about it he's kind of like the evil version or the Soviet version of what Carl Weathers is where Dylan he's mm. working with the local military to support a cause or rebel against a cause and that's right exactly what he is doing what uh, carl weathers is doing from the whatever government or whatever country this is this their government valverde's uh government so that that's that's why he kind of stands out in a few different ways not only his size but also his look and his language and you're you're probably saying to yourself like oh something's up like this is playing to our our cold war stereotypes that soviets are the bad guys you need people like me so you can point your fucking fingers and say that's the bad guy so say good night to the bad guy the last time you're gonna see a bad guy like this again let me tell you remember that's yeah, the bad guy say, right there we got yeah. we got our soviet bad guy again yeah yeah that's it's another uh parallel with for example, Rambo had something similar where even though in First Blood Part 2, he's in Vietnam, there's a Soviet advisor that gets brought in. Mm. Right. But an interesting parallel between uh, Dylan's character and, and Sven, or sorry, yeah, Carl Weathers' character and, and Sven here. Mm-hmm. Interesting mm-hmm. parallel. I never thought of it that way. Um, the, I just wanted to dive into the field manual real quickly. Uh, the field manual for jungle operations from the Army, 1982, is something I've been, is a document I've been perusing and referencing um, for a lot of the minutes recently. Um, and this minute makes, uh, I, I can make use of the field manual once again. So thanks, Smooth McGroove. I really do it for the audio drop of Smooth McGroove <laughs> doing his little Contra acapella song. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, this section is titled Types of Conventional Forces in the Jungle. It's on page 4 3. It's talking about what kinds or how the enemy is organized. And it says most potential jungle enemies are infantry, are infantry forces supported with artillery, mortars, and armored vehicles organized along the lines of da, 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 Soviet forces. Mm. Mm. So oh. it's mentioned right there in the jungle manual, like these are the bad guys. Like that's the bad guy. We're naming them. It's like if you're reading something from World War II and it says the Nazis are the bad guys. That's the bad guy. Like and it's like this field <laughs> manual. Like okay, just just in case. Um, and they do extend it to really, really push how bad the Soviet forces could be. It says these forces may also have a capability to conduct tactical air operations and nuclear, biological, chemical warfare. That's the bad guy. They may be equipped with weapons and equipment that are a generation or two older than those found in more modern armies. So it's like it puts them up a peg and then it kind of knocks them down a peg. <laughs> so yeah, they're capable of all this, but usually their stuff's a little bit you know, out of circulation. <laughs> yeah, so just a little heads up that people in the army in the 80s, like they're, they're being told, hey, Soviets are the bad guys. That's the bad guy. They're the enemy. Once again. Once again, that's the bad guy. Yeah. Say goodnight to the bad guy. So say goodnight to the bad guy. Um, so I wonder, uh, can we talk about the hostage real fast before we move on? Of course. Of course. Yeah. Sweet. So he kills the hostage it's a uh, normally a stunt man is what this actor plays his name is steve boyum or boyum 
um, primarily a stuntman, but he also directed some movies such, such as, and I don't know any of these movies, but I noticed he has, <laughs> he has some sequelitis and some uh, rebootage. Uh, Meet the yeah, Deedles. Man, this, this list of movies is pretty <laughs> incredible. Yeah. Uh, Meet the Deedles. Mom's Got a Date with a Vampire. Stepsister from Planet Weird. Slapshot 2. Time That's Cop amazing. 2. Time Cop 2. <laughs> right. Wow. King Solomon's Minds, which is the reboot, not the really cool campy one from the 80s. Not the, not the Canon Pictures one? It's not, a different one? Yeah, not, not the Richard Chamberlain one, but a different uh, one. Okay. Uh, episodes from uh, quite a few different TV shows. Numbers, NCIS, NCIS Los Angeles, Human Target, Hawaii Five-0, the reboot, Castle, then the TV show Lethal Weapon, the TV show Rush Hour, <laughs> oh, and then he's performed stunts in just tons and tons of movies. A lot of movies you've heard of, um, such as Predator. He, he must be doing some stunts later on in this movie, which is hilarious to think about. I love that idea. Mm -hmm. he's killed in one scene, performing stunts in another scene. Um, so I'll have to watch out for him. Um, but some things like Apocalypse Now, Beastmaster, A Team. I mean. A team. It's not. It's not our last tie-in to the A team. Hmm. Uh, Lethal Weapon Two, Twins, Action Jackson, Days of Thunder, Thelma and Louise, Last Boy Scout, written by Shane Black, Cuffs, yeah. Lethal Weapon Three, Patriot Games, Rapid Fire, Groundhog Day. That's one of my highlights. I'm, I'm thinking like, yeah. oh, like all the stunts at Groundhog Day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Drop Hopefully. Zone, True Lies, Sudden Death, Yumi and Dupree, and then my favorite from Yumi this list. And Dupree. My favorite from this list is Mr. Holland's Opus. <laughs> the name of this class is Music Appreciation. I don't see you appreciating anything. This is such like bullshit. Sit down. <laughs> trying to imagine what stunts he's running for. <laughs> so much action in that movie. <laughs> like Richard uh, Dreyfus just running away from the explosion. Like, oh my yeah. god. I got. <laughs> I got to turn the volume down every time I watch Mr. Holland's Opus. There's just too much action going on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really loud. <laughs> I always, I always felt like Mr. Holland's opus sounded like the name of a of a porno. Mm. <laughs> That's cool. <Yeah. laughs> no, no one else liked that joke. Fine, okay. I just wondered what is the opus in the. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> what is the opus? What is the opus? Why is it on Mr. Holland? <laughs> Where does she hide it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's a pretty amazing list of movies, though. Um, that's it. That runs the gamut. It's all over the place. I get that's another example. I think of somebody uh, who can work, who has worked in Hollywood for a while, and not necessarily worked on the best stuff, but uh, mm -hmm. been around, been in, and been in things that people know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So just find your niche and then time cop two. Yeah. I, it's, it's interesting. Cause when you mentioned King Solomon's minds and this is just a small story, but I've never heard this done before and I have never heard it done since I heard it. But when that came out on TV, I actually remember this because they were advertising it on radio. According to the biblical accounts, they found a place where it was said that the ancestors of the ancients had buried a huge treasure trove of riches of every kind. Gold, diamonds, emeralds, rubies. This place was called Athir. In Indianapolis, <laughs> where I was living at the time. And mm -hmm. every day, going to, being driven to school, we'd have the radio on and they would just talk about, don't miss King Solomon's Mines. And I just, I never forgot about that because I'd never heard of that. <laughs> Did you ever watch it, Patrick? No, but I remember that. <laughs> Oh, you missed it. <laughs> now I wish I had because I looking at it now it's got Patrick Swayze in it, so that automatically makes it worth oh watching. Oh my god. What? what was the time what was the time frame? When was that a TV show? This was two thousand four. It was a television oh miniseries my. in two thousand four. But And Patrick Swayze was yeah, in, it in two thousand four. That's like Donnie Darko time. That, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, wow. But, uh, that, but just Patrick Swayze being in it, I mean, that makes it worth seeing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, man. Patrick Swayze. I guess you'll have to just catch <laughs> King Solomon's Minds, Patrick, for us and let us know how it is. Cause <laughs> okay. I'm really busy. That'll be, uh, that'll be the next minute, right? 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. That's the that's sequel. Right. King Solomon's Mines, the reboot <laughs> minute. <laughs> Oh, no, we couldn't handle the uh the fame that we'd get for that one. Oh my god just it'd be like exponentially expanding our fan base <laughs> right one becomes one <laughs> <laughs> to the power of one <laughs> i know exponents jeff that's right i learned yeah, i learned was, some math. I, was, I was impressed by that well done thanks all right should we bring this to the to the end of our minute here yeah yes. yeah so we have an action-packed first right 30 31 32 seconds here a lot to talk about yeah but how do they how do they wrap up this minute jeff what do they do well after the poor bastard gets shot in the head <laughs> poor bastard uh we yeah we see our we see sven walk away and then it cuts back to arnold looking in the binoculars and boy is he upset mm-hmm. and uh he kind of turns around and leans up against the log and you know, looks all sad for a moment, but then he switches into like pure business mode. I feel like mm-hmm. he gets over his sadness and he's just throwing hand signals to all his buddies. Music kicks in. Tells there uh, too. Yeah, yeah. Music kicks in. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get we get the strings. And we get the team in gear. So he gives all the team members different uh, instructions as where to go. Yeah, it makes makes me think like, y- you know, like where there's that stage of grieving if a family member dies, but then there's like, well, crap, there's like business to attend to, like funeral arrangements and letting everybody know and setting right. up all this stuff. Like Arnold, I think would be, or at least Dutch is Arnold's character. Dutch would be awesome at this because, you know, he, the family member would pass away and then he'd like lower the binoculars. He'd look resigned and like kind of <laughs> sad for a moment, but then he'd be like, all right, let's round up the team. We have, you know, pallbearers. We have the... You know, army crawl into the kitchen, the kitchen. Gra- grab the jello mold like he's on top of it like yeah set up the catering like he's he, he, he take care of business and yeah. i mean it's it's really cool to see a character in, in a movie just so good at taking care of business just like knowing exactly what what to do even though right you're having to improvise when you come across such a situation like well, what do we do we need to find out first and then we need to come up with the plan like immediately after i love it right and he motions to all the of the crew uh, to come down the hill, and then they immediately all start <laughs> army crawling down this hill. Right. And I was secretly hoping that they would all just like start somersaulting together or something. <laughs> this is another example of, uh, of something where they're going down the hill, and I was always doing the how is nobody seeing him doing this? They're going right. down the hill and rustling through. Leaves. Right. They're s- not very subtle. Six yeah. of them at this point, not just one, and they're not going <laughs> slow. They're like basically sliding on their bellies, like wee. No, they're like penguins in the jungle. They're just <laughs> woo down the hill. It's pretty great. It's pretty great. Yeah. Oh, did you already so did they, you already say what Dutch says? Uh, no. What does Dutch say? Uh, I, I highlighted the text here. He says they killed one of the hostages. We move. Mac, Blaine, the nest, Billy, Poncho, the guard or guards. Oh, I can't right. tell if he's saying guard or guards. Killed one of the hostages. We move. Mac, Blaine, the nest. Billy, Buncho, the guard. But when he says guard, like I'm thinking, who does he mean? And if you look ahead to the future minute, you find out who he means. And it only takes yeah. Billy, Poncho. When we see them disperse, we don't see Poncho go with Billy, which I found that was interesting. Um, but you all, I think you mentioned the music. Something I noticed when they're playing the music, it's the Predator theme, but it's just like uh, almost like a, a like a maraca or a shaker kind of version of the theme. It's not the it's just the percussion part of it. Yeah, just the percussion. Part yeah. Of it. Yeah, kind of indicates that some some tense stuff is coming up, mm-hmm. and uh, that some some action is ahead. Yeah, and yeah, so Arnold sends them off to their respective spots so that they can uh, presumably attack this guerrilla camp. But he doesn't tell Dylan and Hawkins anything yet. Correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wonder if we're gonna see Moonbeam, Moonbeam. reaches. <laughs> the end of his life <laughs> <laughs> spoiler alert uh poor, signs poor pointing us <laughs> right. send him up to heaven <laughs> guys with long hair never last long in action <laughs> no um, just like your 
Yeah, just like your your joking sidekick doesn't really last long in movies. Mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. So we get the whole crew like somersaults down the hill or whatever, <laughs> and uh, they all kind of convene at the log here. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep, we get the dialogue, and then that's the end. Yeah. 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 Uh, we don't see Blaine here in this minute, which I'm super bummed about. You see him next minute as the team disperses, but even mm -hmm. then, I don't know if you see the whole team together mm -hmm. in, in that next minute. Given what and, uh, uh, what Blaine yeah. is carrying with him. Oh, painless is waiting. I can't. I got to believe that somebody <laughs> said, wait a minute. We can't have him crawling around the leaves with that thing. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody's somersaulting down the hill, like you said, Patrick, it's Blade because he's just like, he has like that extra 100, 200 pounds of weaponry strapped to his back. <laughs> yep. That's where. Do you think they all army crawled down the hill on accident? <laughs> they were trying to walk and then all their gear just weighted them down. <laughs> Change of plans. We crawl. <laughs> I did not work out the buys and the tries <laughs> enough. <laughs> Get my coal work out in. Well, golly, I don't have a ton left over for this minute. I think all I have is the script notes. The original script makes mention that as Dutch is looking around before he sees the hostage ex executed, he notices the campers all packing up their things as if they're about to leave, including some of the things that they're packing up are rocket launchers and radio equipment that look like they're taken from the downed chopper from uh, many minutes ago from the snuggle shack. So mm. that's that's a little bit different. They did mention, I think, because I was just watching it through, they did mention that the rocket launch or the, the heat seeker took out helicopter and then they were talking about, oh, they have heat seekers now? That's pretty advanced. That kind of follows. A bunch of half-assed mountain boys. Yeah. Heat seeker, Dylan. Dylan! That's pretty sophisticated for a bunch of half-assed mountain boys. Yeah. So, well, I mean, if they downed the chopper, right, there'd be no way for them to take the Right, if they hit them with the heat seeker, they couldn't have taken the rockets from the helicopter. So oh. they must have had that for them. And and Sven's character must have been who was coordinating the the Strella, Strella! Um, seven rocket launcher. Mm -hmm. oh, good point. All right. So does that bring us to the end? Have we wrapped up minute number twenty two? Uh, I think we have. Um, All right. Gosh, is there anything else, Patrick? You have for this minute? No, I think I'm good on my end. Okay. So before we find out where we can find. Carl Hungus, the expert. My name is Carl, he's been expert. Um, we talk weekly recommends about things that we've been reading or viewing or apps we've been tapping or shoes we've been wearing or haircuts we've been having or <laughs> I don't know, cool do's that our hairs are done up in. I don't know. So I like to throw it around though, see what our guest would recommend. Patrick, you have something to recommend before we uh, wrap up the show? Uh, on the lines of movies, uh, I recommend uh, checking out Aquaman in a theater near you. If you haven't done so. Aquaman. It's a pretty fun movie. Awesome. Awesome. Any, anything specific that we should be looking for if we're watching Aquaman? The ending is the most uh an explosive technicolor underwater mixture of avatar lord of the rings star wars and godzilla mm. so yeah check check that out jeff yeah uh okay so i'm gonna recommend two things these are two older movies um I have to talk about uh, an experience that uh, I shared with you, John, last week. Mm -hmm. We had the pleasure of uh, seeing a movie together in the movie theater at a, a repertory movie theater in uh, downtown Seattle called the Cinerama. Mm -hmm. And we got to see Robocop, Robocop on the big screen. Can you fly, Bobby? So good. Very yeah. cool. And it was super fun. Super fun. Yeah, and I love that movie, and Robocop has always been one of my favorite movies. I think if I was to make a top ten list of like my favorite movies of all time, it would probably be in there. Mm -hmm. I've always loved Robocop. Drop it! That are alive, you are coming with me. Um, if you ever get the chance to see it on a big screen with a crowd, please, please do that because I had such a good time. And uh, yeah, it's just, that movie is made for a crowd of people it plays to a, a full theater so well totally oh so, yeah so robocop i know it's uh you've all seen it many times if you haven't watched it in a while watched it again you won't be disappointed nice and my second recommend is from another ex uh screening at that same theater that i just went to <gasps> yesterday nice yeah so i went with another buddy and watched um 
Dr. Strangelove. Oh, very Ooh. good. Damn it, gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Very good. Yeah. And I have I have seen Dr. Strangelove, but it had been, gosh, I probably have not seen it since I was a teenager. Um, and as a teenager, a lot of what that movie is saying and doing flew right over my head. Right. You know, uh, I knew it was a famous movie at the time. I went through a phase when I was a teenager where I wanted to see as many classics and famous movies as I could. And I remember watching that one, And uh, but I don't have any memory of it from that viewing. So, um, yeah, it, it's not something you can understand when you're younger. But, boy, watching it now as an adult, it's uh, scary how relevant it is. It is absolutely hilarious and it's satirical tone <laughs> the performances are unbelievable i i was blown away by peter sellers and uh george c scott they're so good in it um and it's a kubrick i mean so look at what you know what can i say about kubrick that hasn't been said before yeah. but uh yeah dr strange love on the big screen with the crowd was also a phenomenal experience so do it if you ever have the means will do so you had yeah. peter weller and peter sellers oh yes. yeah i did yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, for a minute there, I thought I had mixed them up. But yeah, you're no, right. You, <laughs> I got both, you both Peters. I'll, I'll mess it up yeah. in post so you say the wrong thing in the wrong... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I like Thanks. Batman. That was the best movie. Be Superman. Uh, I liked it in the last minute how you superimposed yourself saying, <laughs> what was it, in the name of a country? Or the, what was it? The name the name of the I said, like, I'll add that, and it says Mexico City. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was, yeah. So professional. <laughs> it was like, Mexico City. <laughs> I just had someone else say it just for fun. Just... <laughs> right. No, that was me. Mexico City. <laughs> yeah. Mexico City. Yeah. What do you got, John? What are you recommending this week? Uh, well, Based on my new friend Ryan's recommendation, Ryan is who Jeff and I saw the movie Robocop with last week. I dug a little bit deeper into the show Ash versus Evil Dead. Oh, oh yeah. With, yeah, so with, the, with the ageless Bruce Campbell playing the titular Ash. Groovy. <laughs> and mm-hmm. most everybody else on the show playing the titular Evil Dead, the Deadites. Right. It just it just basically continues in the universe of the Evil Dead series where, where Ash is going across the land fighting Deadites. Um, and it's just just yeah. it's just so much blood so much blood it's just it knows exactly what it is um it does exactly what it means to do uh, which is just kind of paint this lovely landscape of horror and cornball comedy um <laughs> just just yeah beautifully brought together by bruce campbell so highly recommend that one um ash versus evil dead you can find that on netflix right now i think the first couple seasons and i think it actually airs on stars i might have that right or showtime one of those two i'll edit that in post (laughs) nope that's right it's on it's on stars and the first couple seasons are on netflix stars there you go (laughs) yeah (laughs) add that in post stars (laughs) okay cool so now's the time of the show where we ask our guest where can we find you patrick where can we find you and i know exactly where you are you're in cleveland yep um (laughs) come on down to cleveland town everyone fun times in cleveland today cleveland come on down to cleveland town everyone Come enjoy both of our buildings. Come and look at both of our buildings. <laughs> <laughs> at, at least we're not Detroit. At least we're not Detroit. We're, we're not, not Detroit. Detroit. <laughs> we're not Detroit. Uh, if you uh, want to find me, um, I do have a, a little WordPress blog where I review uh, movies, mostly uh, recent movies. So uh, find me posting movie reviews at uh, zmoviereviews.wordpress.com. That's zmoviereviews.wordpress.com. Uh, mm-hmm. Pop, come on by. I just put up a review of Bumblebee tonight. So yeah, yeah I was just looking at that. Yeah, and I didn't well, just looking at. It, I clicked on the link. I haven't read it yet, but yeah, I, I've heard a lot of good things about Bumblebee, and I look forward to reading your review. It's a nice little movie. Definitely recommend it. Awesome. Um, so Jeff, what are, where can people find uh, the expert Carl Hungus? My name is Carl. He's been expert. No, oh, once again, <laughs> uh, I am on Twitter. Uh, capital K Carl underscore capital H. Hungus, Carl Hungus, uh, 314 on Twitter. Uh, you can find me there. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on uh, 
Instagram, sort of. I have an Instagram. <laughs> I have an Instagram. <laughs> I'm in my I'm in my garage podcasting. <laughs> you can find me here too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's all I got. Well, yeah. thanks, Carl. Hungus pie. Hey, no Appreciate problem. That. Thank you, John. All right. And if you out there, a listener, have anything to say about Sven Oli Torsen, the Danish with the muscle, I don't know. I don't have a good nickname for him. If you have a good nickname for Sven Oli Torsen, listeners, let us know at PredatorMinute at gmail.com. Maybe you found the explanation of the blanks uh, a little bit off or a little bit wrong. Go ahead and let us know. I, I'd love to have some corrections and my own IMDb firearm goofs I, I can air on the next minute. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter, Predator Minute. And f- if, oh. Sven is, <laughs> if, if Sven is eating a donut, could he be the Danish uh, with the Danish? He could totally be the Danish with the Danish. <laughs> Yes. Oh, that makes me want a Danish anybody, now. Anybody? <laughs> okay, drop in the padoom. <laughs> yeah, we'll throw in a good sound effect for you, Jeff. Don't worry. <laughs> All right, perfect. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I live for the drops, John. I live for the drops. All right, good stuff. The Danish with the Danish. <laughs> You're welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, but you can find us there. And for Predator Minute, I've been John Zabriskie. And I'm Jeff Glover. And I'm Patrick Zabriskie. And until next time, stick around. Danishes. The bison tries. Don't burn your Get out the battery.